So ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, welcome you uh, to this morning's uh, first panel on uh, technological innovation regulatory policy and uh, the China Canada interface. Can you all hear me? Um, I, this panel uh, will run as the others have for an hour and a half. The first hour we will have a dialogue with our uh, three speakers and uh, the final part of the program we will open this up to questions from the floor. And uh, I'm going to encourage our panelists to very much engage with uh, dialogue with one another and I certainly hope when we come to the questions from the floor that many of you who are Trudeau scholars will uh, be thinking of great uh, questions for our panelists. My name is Elizabeth Beale. I am a Trudeau mentor and uh, the president of the Atlantic Provinces Economic uh, Council. I have for a long time been interested in supporting initiatives that uh, uh, promote the intersect between the environment and uh, the economy. And I'm currently um, uh, one of the uh, eco-fiscal uh, commissioners and Chris, you'll be pleased to know that we've already heard something about uh, the Ecofiscal Commission at uh, the conference already. I would like to introduce uh, your panelists to, to you. Um, uh, first of all, on my immediate left, uh, uh, Art Hansen, also a Trudeau mentor in his time, is a distinguished fellow with the in uh, International Institute for Sustainable Development and earlier served as the Institute's president and uh, CEO. He is currently uh, the international chief advisor and a member of the China Council for in, uh, International Cooperation on Environment and Development, a body that provides advice to the State Council and the Premier of China, and he has a long-standing interest in linking science to public policy. And I first met uh, Art when he was the director of the School for Resource and Environmental Studies at Dalhousie University. Next to Art is uh, Chris, Chris Reagan. He is the associate professor uh, in economics at McGill University and a research fellow at the C.D. Howe uh, Institute. And uh, Chris has had a notable, notable career in participating with a number of public policy uh, think tanks and as an advisor to uh, government. He is currently the head of the Ecofiscal Commission and we'll talk a little more about uh, that uh, later. And lastly, on uh, my far left, we have uh, Tom Rand. And uh, Tom has a, a very interesting career. He started out uh, as a software entrepreneur he is now focused on issues around uh, carbon mitigation, uh, very involved in uh, clean tech venture capital through the ARC-10 uh, ventures, and I hope, Tom, you'll have a chance to talk a little about that on the panel. He's also an advisor at uh, the Mars Discovery District and uh, a member of a number of other uh, clean tech uh, companies uh, uh, as boards and other organizations. And Tom, you'll be pleased to hear that, and we were very pleased to see your book, Waking the Frog, uh, uh, distributed at, part, at the dinner. Thank you. <laughs> and I haven't made it through all the book yet, but I, it has some very interesting ideas, and I know it's been very inspiring to many in the audience here. So we're very pleased to have all these panelists here. Please join me in thanking them for being here. Now I'm going to step down. I just wanted to make sure that you were able to uh, get a focal point for the panel up front. I'm going to leave the uh, podium. And we'll start in with some of the questions for uh, the panelists. And I, as I said, panelists, I very much encourage you to engage in a dialogue with one another as various topics um, uh, come up. Chris, I'm going to start with you and give you a chance to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Ecofiscal uh, Commission. Uh, Chris launched the commission on November the 4th 
It is a blue ribbon panel of 12 prominent Canadian uh, economists and uh, a large advisory board that includes business and political leaders. And some of you have already seen the uh, coverage we've had from a number of those um, uh, individuals. It's all designed to provide a set of fiscal recommendations over the next five or six years to help various levels of government move along on this um, agenda and help our economy become more uh, sustainable. Um, so Chris, let me just ask you about the Ecofiscal uh, Commission. Um, what is the intent of the Ecofiscal uh, Commission? Is it only intended to influence actions inside Canada or does it also have ambitions to move beyond that into the international arena? Are modest people. Um, we're going to stay within the boundaries of this fine and very large country. So the Ecofiscal Commission, for those of you who have not heard about it, um, it is a group of economists, as Elizabeth said, from across the country who are, um, who have a great deal of policy experience. Experience in um, making policy, implementing policy, analyzing policy, writing about policy, uh, and advising governments about policy uh, from across the country backed by a group of advisors who are um, really exceptional Canadians from across business, across, across the political spectrum, civil society, from the environment. Uh, and the goal of the Ecofiscal Commission is to, um, is to talk about what we are calling ecofiscal reform, which is reforms to our fiscal systems um, that, will, uh, that will change prices in the fiscal system, they will change incentives uh, produced by the fiscal system, and those changes in incentives will hopefully change behavior and change outcomes. And they will change both environmental outcomes and they will change economic outcomes. So really the, the motivating observation from the Ecofiscal Commissioners and Advisors is that we, in Canada, we can do better in terms of economic outcomes. We lag other countries in terms of our innovation, in terms of our productivity. That threatens our, uh, the level of our per capita GDP over time. And that we can do better in terms of environmental outcomes. We are currently very um, resource intensive in terms of, not I'm talking about what we produce, but how we produce what we produce. We are, our environmental footprint is much larger than in many other countries. Uh, we use more water per unit of GDP most other countries. We use, emit more greenhouse gases per unit of GDP than most other countries. We, um, we use more resources in general per unit of GDP. So through careful redesign of our fiscal systems across the country, so we're talking about federal policy, provincial policy, and local policies, we can actually um, change those outcomes. We can provide incentives for people to pollute less, and I'm not talking just about carbon, I'm talking about all types of pollution. Incentives to pollute less, uh, incentives to develop cleaner technologies, to adopt cleaner technologies. Uh, and a key part of eco-fiscal reform, and this is, I'll stop on this thought, a key part of eco-fiscal reform is that you get benefits from pricing pollution, both in terms of reducing the amount of pollution and in producing incentives to innovate around that pollution. But the second part of eco-fiscal reform is that you generate revenues that can then be recycled back into the economy. And as you recycle those revenues by either reducing other taxes or protecting vulnerable families or investing in critical infrastructure or investing in clean tech, you get to choose, as a government, you get to choose which other benefits you get. Uh, and different governments in different places will likely choose different So our focus is on Canada. Our fo we are national in scope are very much regional in detail. We think the, the, the different details, the different realities in the different regions, different cities matter tremendously in terms of the design of the policy. Um, and so far we do not have a design, a mandate, or a, a, a goal of going beyond Canada's boundaries except possibly for a vacation. <laughs> Which I haven't had in a while. <laughs> Um, Art, let me turn to uh, you and just ask about um, the issues around uh, sustainability and the environment and what kind of connection there is between interests in China and uh, Canada where you've worked most of your career so you know that 
situation yeah. very well. What can you tell us about that kind sure. of intersect? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, working in China is, is an adventure in itself. Uh, think of you're dealing with the biggest, in some ways the best, in some ways the worst, but in a, a country where the government is truly motivated towards exactly what Chris is saying, uh, eco-fiscal reform, uh, and, and uh, in, tends to place that in the context of its overall reform policies, market-based reform, uh, efforts to be involved in transformative change, not just uh, nibbling at the edges, but really undertaking fundamental shift uh, in the country and at the level of how people live. Uh, Right now, uh, it's approaching 50-50 people in cities uh, versus people in the countryside. When I first started working in China, it was only 30% of the people living in the cities. It's going to be 70% by 2030. Uh, and, and that's a huge, huge, it's never, we've never seen anything like this in the world. It represents a great opportunity, but if you look at those cities, which I think are the future of sustainable development in China, um, that uh, they don't have a property tax system in place, uh, partly for reasons of land ownership, who owns what. And so uh, the cities are forced to raise their revenues by expanding into the countryside and then selling that, uh, creaming off the difference by reselling it, uh, sorry, buying it cheap, selling it high to developers who uh, then develop it and sell it even higher. It's not a sustainable system. Uh, but on the other hand, these are centers of creativity. They're centers where, uh, that have allowed China to essentially move into a world leadership position on uh, uh, solar and uh, 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 wind energy, for example. Not the only things that they, they're doing, for sure. But uh, so there's many inconsistencies. And if uh, one spends time, as I do in Beijing, a lot of time, and come back with the symptoms of uh, sickness from uh, air pollution, and the leaders there, as early as in the 19, late 1990s, uh, Zhu Rongji, I can recall, twice telling us that he had gone to the mayor of uh, Beijing and said, look, uh, I, I have to live in the city. It's where my job is as premier of China. Uh, but uh, I figure it's going to take five years off my life. I don't like that. Do something about it. So the top leadership gets it. They understand. They want to have green economy, green development. OK, so that's the Chinese side. Um, when we take that back, why, why did I want to be on this panel? Why did I want to link Canada and China? The, the quick answer is that we're inextricably linked. We want to sell things to China. China wants some of our resources. We get their pollutants. They come to Canada, whether it's mercury, whether it's carbon uh, black on the uh, surface of the uh, Arctic. Uh, we're linked in relation to the opening of the uh, Arctic Ocean. I could go on and on, and one that I particularly uh, like to think about is, the, uh, and worry about, uh, is uh, automobiles, okay? So we had this great pact that served us for many years with the United States, and it became a mainstay of the Canadian economy. So what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years, China's putting in place all the right things for the electric vehicle. They're, they're uh, for example, uh, making sure that government uh, purchases uh, uh, for new vehicles have a heavy focus on uh, EVs. Not, not 10 years from now, but now, from this point on. Um, what happens with us when we don't have those technologies well developed in Canada? Will China come to us in the same way that we worked with the Japanese uh, to uh, bring some of those advanced technologies in here? Or will they leapfrog over us? I could go on and on in that kind of a setting. Uh, but l let me say from the start that uh, I think in terms of the policy making in China, I think that the leaders there, uh, not just one or two, but the system uh, is much more receptive to taking on the ideas that Chris and others are bringing out and we've been listening to in this uh, uh, forum by comparison uh, to Canada. Uh, I'll just say that bluntly, at the national level. And I think at the provincial level, it's probably about equal. Uh, the provinces in China are equally interested. They want to get some of the action of the green economy in their places, and, uh, and that's working for them. Um, I, I would say that one of the great strengths that we have in dealing with China, and I don't think we use this strength to our maximum advantage, is, is our cities. Uh, the cities in Canada, the Chinese are genuinely interested in because they think they work. 
And, and if we look at where the real progress is in terms of many of the fiscal arrangements, et cetera, uh, within what the boundaries of what cities can do, they're incentivized to some extent, but there is a genuine interest in Canadian cities in becoming green and greener. Uh, China knows that, uh, we know that, but we don't take maximum advantage of it. Uh, we're, we're still coming from behind. And, and uh, the final thing I'd say is that, uh, uh, of course, the relationship between the United States and China is special. And, and I see a lot of triangles out there where we have to insert ourselves into that relationship as well. APEC meeting is one example of it, uh, and, and there's, there's others. But we're, we're fighting from behind the times with China. And, and we're fighting in ways that haven't fully at all integrated where the Chinese are right now in their thinking about uh, green development. And I'll stop there. The theme that you were uh, introducing there in terms of our, our need for us not just to take incremental um, uh, shifts but leap ahead is something, Tom, that you've certainly uh, talked about and I, was, I have a great little quote in uh, your book where you say, incremental change can do more harm than good by leading us down a blind alley. Small changes think us, sucker us into thinking we're doing what's needed when we're not even coming uh, close and that what we really need to do is go for the moonshot right away, rebuilding our entire energy uh, system quickly to bring in uh, the changes we need. So we've had a lot of conversation about that already at um, uh, this meeting. What do you think offers, from a policy perspective, the best opportunities for us to move ahead? What that will help us to make those technology leaps that we so desperately need? Um, well, I'll, so I'll speak from the perspective of an entrepreneur. I mean, that, that's really what I do. My, my role is to, uh, through Arcturn Ventures, we invest in not bleeding edge technologies. Bleeding edge is in the lab. Uh, this is cutting edge technologies, technologies that are, that are entering the marketplace and that we're attempting to, to scale up. And from that perspective, I, I would first just say there's, there's nothing like a price on carbon. Everything else is second to a price on carbon. Uh, um, uh, Chris has done a great job through the Ecofiscal Commission in, in, in arguing why it's fair and effective and so on. Um, I'll add to that by saying something from the perspective of an entrepreneur. Uh, look, one of the things that I really respect is the creativity of the market, right? Uh, and also its power. Uh, and only a price on carbon, in my mind, can do two things simultaneously, which, is, which sounds like a paradox, but it's not. Simultaneously harness the market to prevent it from doing something, which is burn every piece of economically viable chunk of coal in the ground but simultaneously unlock its creative potential, right? Because the market is an enormously creative thing. It's unpredictable in, in, uh, in, in, in outcomes and so on. So price on carbon unlocks all that creativity. Um, but more practically speaking, I don't, I don't think this is sort of enough. So there are some things that Canada is doing correctly, and I think we should double down on what we're doing correctly. So clean tech is not like IT, right? It's not like you build a piece of software and then cookie cut it. I mean, this is infrastructure. It's big wires, not little wires. It's pots of bubbling fluid. I mean, it's big things. <laughs> and so it's capital intensive. And the venture capital community, particularly in North America, and including Silicon Valley, has been burned very badly, uh, I think partly because it treated uh, clean tech like it was IT. Um, and it's not. And so one of the things we do right in Canada is the Paul Martin government set up something called Sustainable Development Technology Canada, SDTC for short, which provides non-dilutive capital, support for private capital. I mean, you have, to, you have to have private capital at the table, you have to have a customer. Um, so it's not just throwing money at projects, it's very well timed and very well placed. But without that non-dilutive capital, some of our companies wouldn't exist. Um, I'll give you some examples. Woodland Biofuels, these guys can make gasoline replacement from forestry waste and agricultural waste. And they can make it cheaper than the gasoline it replaces. But it can compete on the open field with, with hydrocarbons. Morgan Solar can make solar power for five cents a kilowatt hour in the oil-rich Mideast. Again, on a level playing field, it can compete with fossil fuels. HydroStore, underwater compressed air energy storage, you combine it with wind and you can beat diesel in the open playing field. So, you know, it's not enough just that these little companies are beginning to compete. They require scale, right? So STTC helps get those technologies into the market. Without them, I don't think, well, two of those companies wouldn't exist for sure. The other thing we're doing right, you need to scale into the marketplace. So Morgan wants to go and build 80 megawatts or 100 megawatts of systems in Mexico or the Mideast. EDC, Export Development Corp, uh, is at the table uh, working very hard to figure out what technical risks remain. 
right? Because banks don't like tech risk. They don't understand tech risk. That's not what they do. So if you ask a banker, uh, how many years do I have to operate my technology before you'll give me a 20-year debt? And they'll say, 20 years, because then I know it works for 20 years. Uh, well, with that, we want to shorten that time frame. And EDC works very hard with people like Deutsche Bank and so on to understand what the underlying risks really are and put some kind of a performance warrant or performance guarantee in there, which enables lending institutions in Mexico and around the world to lend money for customers to buy these products, which ultimately brings the cost down. So that's a scaling issue. Those two we do right. Let's double down on SDTC and EDC. Um, flow through shares are really important. We don't have, we have flow through shares for our mining industry. Uh, that's part of the reason we have so many junior mining stocks with capital to play with. I won't get into the details of what flow through shares mean, but it essentially provides an impetus, a stimulus for an investor to take a chance on equity, putting equity into a, into a young company. Um, so flow through shares, I think, should be extended to the clean tech sector. Um, what else have I got? Well, there's some big stuff like green bonds. I mean, this is the idea of leveraging the government's risk rate to raise large pots of money to accelerate some of these technologies in, into, into the field and so on. And that sort of, I think, is a step further down from something like, like an EDC. Um, so I think we are doing things right, and I think we should double down on those and things we're doing wrong. It's very difficult in this country to get venture capital, to get equity into technical risky plays. It's just culturally not what we do. I don't think you can regulate that. I think what you can do is provide incentives and things like flow through shares can, can, can do that. And there are, of course, some very high risks in technologies that go absolutely nowhere. I'm thinking of the um, tidal barrage technologies that China was an early investor in that largely died. Let, let me ask the other two panelists, how, how does Canada uh, on that technology uh, front um, the initiatives that, uh, that Tom has identified, how do we stack up relative to other jurisdictions? Or what, do you, what do you see in China? Well, I, I think uh, starting with the first one, SDTC, uh, which I've admired from the beginning, and I think it's been well managed, uh, and it's had the trust of different kinds of government in Canada. And I keep saying to myself, why doesn't China have an SDTC? Uh, and the quick answer is because they've got so much money that they can throw at things that they can take that role, but they don't do it as efficiently, in my view, as they should. And they're distrustful of things outside of their own state-owned enterprises. Uh, so they, they operate in terms of the kind of technology innovation side. Uh, it's happening on it's, it's, a huge scale, unimaginably huge scale, but it's also a punishment system. It doesn't encourage the entrepreneurs to make it all the way through. Uh, it encourages kind of big investment, big this, that, or the other, and I think that works to their disadvantage. What I would say, though, that what we have to be thinking about from a Canadian perspective is where we fit in, because the Germans are there uh, in a very unified way from uh, the Chancellor down. Uh, to work exactly on these things. The French uh, in their nuclear power uh, system are, are doing this, the same, huge investment. The Americans have been working, uh, you know, the, this latest announcement that they made with the Chinese, behind that is uh, five years of work, all directed towards energy technology, building green, uh, building huge uh, investments into uh, really clean power plants uh, of one sort or another. So we're not making that kind of effort with uh, China. And, and I think that's going to come back and bite us because in a number of different ways. One is uh, it's, it's become very popular to talk about stranded assets. You know, the, the ship is going in one direction and if the world is going in another direction, uh, big trouble. And so in the case of China, they are actively, uh, not just passively, actively uh, saying we've got to have peak coal and we've got to have it soon. We've got to make a peak in our use of coal by uh, say 2017, 2020, around that time. We've got to have a big peak in, in uh, oil by maybe 2025, maybe sooner. So here we are trying to build our whole future economy and technology around some things with the intent of selling it primarily to China and to India. Uh, and, and here's China saying, we've got to change. We've got to get into the renewable energy stuff. And, and so they're now talking about, and they're in there already, they're the biggest in the world. And they're going to be coming and selling very refined products to us. And unless we're actually devising and working on these uh, 
uh, advanced materials, etc., and the full range of management technologies that go with them, clean grids and so forth, or uh, uh, smart grids, I should say, that, that uh, will tie the renewables together, then we're going to be left in the dust. And, and so I don't want to be too, uh, you know, I'm not up here to be dire in my comments, I, but I think we're not, we're kind of a bit asleep, I think, at the switch in terms of uh, the opportunity side, because China says, don't use the word barriers. Use two words, uh, challenges and opportunities. And they are very good at turning things into opportunities. I think we're not as good at this point in time about seeking the opportunity side. And, and that comes back in part to policies, etc. Uh, so I'll stop there. Yeah, I think you've made some very interesting points on that. And it, it makes me think, Chris, about the agenda we have uh, underway for the Ecofiscal Commission, of which I am a member, we haven't really grappled yet with these big technology issues and policy environment around that. How do you how do you see that fitting in? So, good question. So, um, as, a, as Tom was talking about SDTC and EDC, um, I was thinking about the debate, uh, quite a legitimate, I think, debate that exists among economists and others about about pricing pricing pollution, pricing carbon emissions. And there's one half, or one, you know, one, one side of the debate that basically argues that if you attach a price to carbon or other forms of pollution, um, then you will, you will unleash the magic of the market, as Tom said, um, and you will create incentives for innovation, um, and you create a clear incentive right away to reduce pollution, but also over the longer term, incentives for innovation. And that that is all you need to do. So moving forward, you put the price on carbon. You have a price that ramps up over time. It sends the forward price signal to everybody. Uh, and you just then step back and watch the market unfold. Um, and, and I think actually there's a very powerful argument to say that's all you need to do. You need to do it properly. You need to do it sensibly. But that's all you need to do. But the other half of the debate says that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And the argument basically is that, and, and in order to make this argument really sound, you have to think about the amount of reductions, emissions reductions that we need globally and the time that we need it. So let's suppose you take a number like 80% reductions by 2050. Okay, that's a, a number that we're kind of a combination of numbers that we've often seen. 80% reductions in the flow of emissions by 2050. If you want to generate that kind of emission reductions, and we're not, and we're going to have an economy that you know continues on more or less its current path, then um, it's not enough to, uh, you know, re reducing emissions is good, but you actually have to move energy to alternatives. And then the question is, does this price on carbon, this rising price of carbon, generate those alternatives through the innovation process fast enough? Does it generate enough of them and fast enough that, you know, in the time frame that we need? And some people argue that those, basically, the supply elasticities of the alternative energies simply aren't large enough. So that in addition to the carbon pricing, which is a necessary part of the package, but it's not sufficient, you'd actually have to then directly support technological development. And this brings us exactly to SDTC and EDC and other things like this. So this is a legitimate debate. I'm not actually quite sure where I am on that debate, frankly. But it's, but it's quite a sensible debate. But final comment on SDTC and EDC. Um, so these are, um, these are institutions that fill market gaps. So Tom described that you know, banks Banks aren't prepared to take some risks. Actually, banks are very conservative organizations, and especially in this country, they're conservative, and actually that conservativeness has done us well in the past six years. Um, but they are so conservative that they're not prepared to take some risks. And so there are legitimate gaps in the market that SDTC is filling and that EDC is filling. The danger is that sometimes these organizations, if they get too closely tied to their political masters, they may do much more than fill market gaps. And then you end up throwing money away in bad ways. So you, you really have to design these institutions very carefully. And in fact, I think SDTC and EDC have been designed fairly carefully to be you know, arm's length from government. 
Um, so I, I, I think it fits into this necessary versus sufficiency debate, and you were going to say you, something. You know what I love about that, about the way you framed that argument, uh, which made me smile, was you know half the people are arguing uh, carbon prices. I don't know if it's sufficient. Half. I don't know what the numbers. Uh, no, are. I love it. Okay, call it. Whatever it is, but there's two <laughs> sides to the argument, and what we're arguing about is: is a price on carbon sufficient, or do we need more? And the part right, that's right, not right. in that debate anymore, which I just love, are the people who say we don't need to do anything. So I, I, I love the way that's framed. Except, we, I, we, except, <laughs> I, except I do think there's still a lot of people of who don't think are. we that's, need that's, anything. That's why I, I love the, yeah. the, the conceptual space you brought us to. <laughs> um, just quickly on, on China. Uh, you know, China is a very difficult uh, dance partner, um, particularly for technology companies. I mean, even for whole countries, it's difficult to engage with, with China. Um, I mean, for technology companies, even more so. I mean, Ab and Goa is one of the world's biggest windmill producers, and they went to China, and they set up manufacturing, and they just got ripped off. I mean, there was an entire Ab and Goa copy. And this is Ab and Goa. This is a big, sophisticated company. So the notion of a, of a Canadian tech company like Morgan Solar going over there and dancing with the dragon is very dangerous, right? You're, you're not going to come away with your IP. And we had an interesting conversation last night at dinner, and, and Don Roberts actually came up with a really an interesting idea, which I, I have been scratching my head over ever since. He said, look, just China's got all kinds of money and they have all kinds of problems to solve. So, you know, take a company like Woodland Biofuels, just go over there, have them build the first plant, right? And that way you've got all the risk off the table. It's operating, it's running, and now it's a company that is in the space of, of wanting yield, i.e. debt. Come back and own the North American market and take the benefit of going to China as having been able to now access debt. And just give the China market away for that. Assume you're going to lose it which I thought was a really a interesting dance step. I don't know if I'm fully on board with that yet, but, but the, you know, that's one way of, of dancing with the dragon that, that seems somewhat intriguing. So uh, it's, it's not simple going to China. It, you know. I, I think we have to look at what are the... China won't do anything that's not in its own interest. That's, that's point one. Shot. Yeah, yeah. But, but we often forget that. We think that there's a, a good side to people and uh, countries and so forth that they that they will come along because it's the right thing to do. Well, uh, I don't think, and I will say the same about our own country, sometimes we do the right thing, sometimes we don't. But we're all interested in doing what we think is in our own interest. And, and so we have to explore very carefully. And I think that's what the, one of the great advantages that the Americans have been doing in this energy field with China. They're exploring where they need each other. And China does need Canada for a variety of reasons. It does need Canada. And it needs, and, and we need China. <laughs> so, I mean, so what are those common interests and what are they in this field? Uh, and, and I find it interesting to see how the Chinese react to this question of pricing of, uh, of carbon. They've just pretty much decided they're not going to put a, something that's labeled carbon tax on. I think that's partly because they saw uh, countries like uh, Australia, in which they're rather uh, close to in the energy field, saying carbon tax gone. So if the rest of the world uh, isn't doing it, if China, uh, my belief is that if, if several of the countries said we're going to have a carbon tax, the Chinese are well prepared. They've done all the technical studies. The Ministry of Finance wants it. Lots and lots of people want it there. But they won't put it in place because they're going to put themselves at a competitive risk. And when they see other countries pulling away from it, so they're going to do emissions trading. And that's their excuse for not having a carbon tax. Meanwhile, what they will be doing is uh, changing resource pricing and it'll be a carbon tax in disguise. That's already happening. And, and so we've got to understand, I don't think we understand China well enough and we have egregious cases of uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, Toyota for a long time wouldn't put Prius automobiles in China because they're afraid of losing that technology. They do now. Uh, and and uh, uh, the, the latest, the uh, Tesla people are working with the Chinese to put up a whole system of uh, charging stations across China. China China's got the, car, uh, the, the uh, charging stations in place, their own, working cooperatively with Tesla and others. Uh, well, where are we going to be left in that kind of situation? I, that may be an extreme example, but I could give lots of others. And, and again, uh, working with a country that's going to, I think China's going to spend more on the environment than any other country in the world for the next 10 years. My Chinese colleagues don't quite agree with me on this, but they know that they're getting there very close. It's trillions of dollars they're going to spend, not billions. You, trillions. Can, you can see the possibility of a virtuous circle here, right? Exactly. Canada, exactly. North America is good at innovation. We can be better. Yes. And there, I have lots of suggestions as to how to improve it. I mean, this is what Mars exists for, to, to improve that process. 
But we innovate better than China does, and China manufactures better than we do. And the scale at which we need to produce this new infrastructure to solve this problem, 80% reduction by 2050 is no joke, we need the kind of manufacturing muscle that China has, and we also need to be feeding in next generation technologies so the price continues to come down, not just for manufacturing scale, which is why solar is down 80% in price since 2008, it's 80%. It's because China poured money into manufacturing, right? It wasn't just creating demand for the product. It was saying to manufacturers, here's tens of billions of dollars, make a bigger factory. So you can see the virtuous circle that could emerge if we can generate some, some trust around IP that will feed in innovation. That'll bring price down. They'll scale up manufacturing. That's how you solve this problem. Called, I call it the China advantage that they can do those things, and they can do it more quickly than almost anybody else in the world. But I think that the, the other missing element in this discussion is, is uh, third countries. Uh, and what we need to be working with uh, in China, I mean, the, the issue is not just us. It's the developing world, it's, it's uh, markets in Asia, other markets in Asia, it's cooperatively doing things between China, India, and other countries. And, and there's a huge market advantage. And somebody was saying uh, at dinner last night, and, and it's well known that uh, all the green technology stuff in Canada depends very much on the rest of the world for their markets. It's, we're a small market, frankly. And, and uh, so there's real opportunities there that somebody's going to take, uh, whether it's China working with Germany, China working with the United States, or China working with Canada or whatever. If you find the right niches, then that's where there's a lot of money to be made and where we're going to exercise uh, perhaps beyond uh, uh, what we would think we can do now. And, and so um, I think that uh, the side that's missing in this is the role that China is playing to replace, not replace, but to supplement the ways in which the Bretton Woods uh, financial institutions have operated in the past. And they're also putting in place a very different model of international development, depending much more on trade, and a lot of it on trade in green products. Uh, and, and that's where we can either fit in, or we can say we're going to do it the way we've always done it, and maybe fade into insignificance in some of our other relationships around the world as well, trade relationships. And which I think also brings in the need to keep an emphasis on the uh, Export Development uh, uh, Corporation in, uh, in Canada as well, as, as you guys are saying. So, at just our art or, or others, wh where are we on, on those kind of issues? Because they open up all sorts of international uh, trade issues and intellectual property issues. Where, where are we on this spectrum and how can we kind of vault things ahead and address some of these initiatives, either through bilateral agreements or, or uh, multilateral agreements or even cross uh, corporate agreements? Where, where can we kind of arrest this and vault it up a bit? I'll, I'll just say that I'm, I'm not sure where we are. My hunch is that we're not leaders in it. Uh, maybe we are in some specialized ways. Uh, I think we've lost ground in this, as we have in many other areas of our international relationships. You're talking about Canada. Canada, now. yeah. And, and what... Uh, uh, when I say we, I'm usually talking about Canada, and if I'm talking about China, I say China. So I try and keep my Canadian hat on it sometimes. <laughs> it's quite funny because the, the way I have to work there is uh, I'm working, I'm actually paid with Canadian money at this point, although sometimes it's other money. Uh, but, uh, but this council that I'm involved with has about 20 different sources, everything from the World Wildlife Fund and Environmental Defense Fund to the EU and various countries. But we have a leadership role here in Canada, have because we helped to start this thing. But uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, don't really want me, I'm the chief advisor to it, and they want to feel that they're getting advice uh, so uh, it's not just uh, Canadian-led driven but it's advice that's applicable to working with a variety of other interests, Germany and others like this. Those people would love, dearly love, to be in the position we're in in this particular thing, but sometimes I'm, I, I don't get offended by it, but I get hurt a little bit. I don't get invited to things that involve Canada because they want deliberately uh, me to be standing independently of uh, any one source. But I still, anyways, <laughs> it's a little diversion, but it's a way you have to... There's a sensitivity in how you do these things, and I think... We've been up and down on this, but I still think that Canada is highly regarded with, by China in, in its overall relationships for a variety of reasons. That has a great advantage that we have. If you're Canadian there, 
you, you can develop a trust level um, that uh, is really quite extraordinary. And I think that, going back to what you're saying about uh, intellectual property and that, which is a big, big issue, um, uh, there's trust levels and we, we've, we've got to know when we can dis trust our, our relationship and we've got to know when we distrust our relationship, uh, if you know what I mean there. It's, it's really complicated, but as Canadians, I think we have an advantage because the Chinese folks will um, dialogue with us in ways that are different than they do with Germany and with the EU uh, in particular. Yeah, they'll, they'll eat us up faster. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I know. I mean, but, there, but there are some things we don't need to reinvent, right? I mean, there are advantages to sleeping or living next to this giant elephant called the United States. We have very strong economic ties. Our, and, and, and our community of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, like the players in Canada, there's few of us, and there's a few enough of us, that we can be known by Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, and so on. We have very strong legal frameworks with the United States. There's no need for us to reinvent ways in which we deal with intellectual property in international negotiations. We can just tuck in under our American neighbors. We can, when it's to our advantage, partner with our American neighbors to access some of these markets and some of this capital and some of these agreements with these big countries. We don't need to go it alone. Um, so I think we can selectively choose when it's to our advantage to partner with, with the Americans, right? That they're not, you know, it, they're big, but, and that's, that's sometimes good and sometimes bad. Um, but in terms of the big issues like intellectual property and all that, you know, I think we can just tuck in under the Americans and, and if we have a strong agreement with them, they will protect our interests because they'll protect their own. Can I just add yes. something on that? Um, it's not surprising that, you know, your fact from, from last night's dinner that, that most clean tech or green technology, it gets sold outside of the country. This is true for most Canadian industries. Yeah. Canada is a country of 35 million people. And if you have any economies of scale in your industry, the only way you will ever achieve those scale economies is by getting getting your, your products into foreign markets. So, I mean, we have always been and probably always will be um, uh, a trading nation and that trade will be very important to our prosperity. So, so we need to look outside. Now, China has become the flavor of the month for the past decade. Um, so it's the flavor <laughs> of the decade, right? Um, I remember 2003 and four, um, we hardly talked about China at all. Um, I was a special advisor to the governor of the bank in 2004 5 and I noticed at that time that the monetary policy report started talking more and more about China. But two years earlier, we hardly ever talked about China. But of course, China is big. China is currently 25% of the world economy and it's growing faster than almost any place else. So when you're growing at 8% a year, 10 years of 8% a year and you're more than doubling. Um, so. I think there's a tendency, however, to focus too much on China. So China is big, China is important, great. But um, most people in this country don't speak that language. They have an interesting sense of the rule of law. Um, other countries actually are far easier to deal with. I mean, India, frankly, to me, strikes me as a far easier place to deal with on a business point of view um, than China. And of course, there's a whole part of the other world. You know, Europe is a very big place. So if you are a small Canadian clean tech company and you are looking to, you know, to expand and to expand into world markets, I, I, it's not clear to me why the focus should be excessively on China. I, I, I agree. And I, as a friendly amendment to that, I would say as a startup, so as a very small clean tech company, your go to market is where they use diesel. <laughs> it's, you know, 40, 50 cents a kilowatt hour you're competing with. You can pick that stuff off all day long. So it's the Caribbean islands and so on. And that sounds small, the Caribbean. If you're a startup, you have billions and billions of dollars of, of potential revenue from those markets. And that's where you cut your teeth before you go into the, into the big places where you're competing with coal and natural gas, right? So I think there are much more strategic ways of entering the global market. Keeping in mind the Indias and the Chinas may be your, your final destination, but it'll take you years to get there. And the place to cut your teeth are, are you know, Aruba, uh, Rorotango, uh, Hawaii. Those are islands where you can, you can compare. <laughs> well, it's, it's my partner, Marie McCaig, that does all the due diligence uh, trips down to Aruba. I don't oh, know you why. Should you should do it. I, well, look, look, you guys, I, I, I think, uh, yes, what you say may be true to some extent. And I don't disagree. I lived in the Caribbean. It's a great place. Um, and and uh, there's small countries around the world. 
uh, and, and we should be doing those things, but don't duck it. We've been ducking it too long by taking the easy route with the United States and, uh, and to some extent, Europe. Uh, the, the reality is, and, and if we're talking about green reform, I don't think India is doing green reform. The, uh, one of the funny, if, uh, kind of in a deathly sort of way, funny thing is uh, big arguments going on now is uh, New Delhi more polluted in terms of these tiny PM 2.5 particles than Beijing? Right. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, but the, the point is that China is going to invest immensely in the next 15 years. It's going to happen in the next 15 years. If we don't... They're going to invest in everything in the next 15 years, not just green stuff. Not just green stuff, but you would, like, for example, in the science and technology, there's seven new and emerging industries. Okay, five of those our environment and, uh, and related fields, yeah. some of it IT stuff, uh, smart grids and so forth. They're, it's immense investment, but it's also going to position themselves for the, last, uh, uh, the next quarter of the, of the uh, uh, century, which is that period, say, roughly 25 to 50. And, and as we know, uh, and Tom, you've written about it, I mean, that's when we get cooked. Um, in, in that time period. So what we do now in the next 15 years is essentially going to uh, set the stage in infrastructure and everything else for the rest of the century. Yeah, no, I'll, and I'll, there's I'll, one country, there's one yeah. country, two countries, the United States and China, that are critical to that. And the EU is going to be back and forth and various things. So it's fitting into that bigger picture. Do we want to do it? If we just want to go to the Caribbean and yeah. do so things, I, I'll, 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 I'll agree with yeah, you. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying we'll limit ourselves to the Caribbean, but I'm a practical person. And, sure. and the, the kind of cutting edge innovations that we're building, you've got to cut your teeth somewhere. Uh, no, first. Now, I've been thinking about what Don Roberts has been saying about how we approach China for a while. So there may be ways to do this. But I agree with you. Like, even the commitments that China has just made with the U.S., which I think are commitments they're going to meet because they, they announced them because they already have those plans. The amount of green energy they're putting on their grid by 2020 is equivalent to the entire North American grid. Everything. And, and that's, and and that's just clean energy in China. So you're right. Gonna, that they're is going to the do better than that. Yeah. They're going to yeah. push themselves yeah. even faster, yeah. is my yeah. feeling, because once the, once the snowball starts rolling down the hill, you know, it becomes somewhat easier uh, to yeah. uh, do better. And, and that's what's going to happen. So right now they're talking about 20% of their energy. And that's... That's a, uh, that energy curve is still going up pretty dramatically, uh, and well, along with it, the greenhouse gas emissions. So what they're going to find is it's going to be easier because they're converging on the, uh, solving the problems. Uh, so they're taking, as we were saying last night, an integrated yeah. approach and, to it. And, and to add to that, and, I, and again, I, this is a very friendly amendment now. I agree China's yeah. important. Don't ignore it. So I, I'm, I'm just sort of a caveat to that. When you begin to put lots of renewables on a grid, as Ontario has found out, as the Caribbean islands are finding out, as China is finding out, you have instability problems to solve. It yes. requires advanced technology. Canada has a history of being very good at networking, data networking. Yeah. Well, we also happen to be able to translate that data networking capacity into power electronics, energy storage, uh, smart sensors for the grid. So our ability to bring innovation into the market, and these people exist, smart energy instruments out of uh, uh, Oakville, temporal power out of Oakville. I mean, these, these are... The, the, these are technologies that China will need, that they have not invented themselves, that this inflow of clean energy will create problems that we can solve, yeah. and we can uniquely solve. And I think there's a, there's a very key role for Canada in smart grid technologies, the smart of the smart grid. And I think that's something that we, we really need to, we, we can emphasize, and, and is, is a good way to go into China. I, I think that that point actually came up uh, yesterday on you know, where we can move ahead fastest. And on uh, power generation, absolutely, is an area where we have an ability to vault ahead on the technology front. And, uh, you know, we have advantages there. It's not only uh, the Canadian utilities here. We have Canadian utilities who now own utilities outside of Canada and who are invested. I'm thinking of um, Amera, who now own Barbados Light and Power and are struggling with, you know, are building a large solar facility and struggling with that grid issue. So we have all sorts of learning that can be generated in our traditional markets. We don't have to necessarily just go into new markets to make progress in this area. And ironically, that's one of the happy side effects of the Green Energy Act. Controversial piece of legislation, there's lots of pros and cons, um, and you know, I think there's fair arguments on either side, but one of the interesting things is 
there's a five megawatt flywheel asset being run by Hydro One to smooth fluctuations on a, on a feeder because wind is dominant on that feeder. They need, they need to even it out. And that problem of instability has got five megawatts of the world's first low friction flywheel system up and running, and that's a Canadian company. With that system now operational on a real grid, in real time, solving a real problem, that's a showcase for any other grid around the world who needs to solve that problem, and there are many of them, right? So that, just that side effect from the Green Energy Act could, could sort of ignite uh, a, a short-term energy storage company and launch it into global markets. So, so there, there are interesting repercussions when you, when you, when you, when you have See, instability on the grid, and we're solving them in, in, in Canada because we innovate. One of, the, one of the things, going back to what we've got to offer, that, that I think not just China, but a number of countries have, that these technological issues are really management issues. Uh, they're, they're planning and management issues. And, and uh, one of the things that we have a lot of experience on, good and bad, is we've got these big provinces. Uh, and whether you go to India, whether you go to China, and certain other parts of the world, one of the advantages that they see about the Canadian system is we've been able to deal with those management issues, we, uh, uh, which are partly technological in nature, like the clean grids and that, or the smart grids. But, but a lot of it is simply the policies that work the inter-jurisdictional policies that are necessary in a country like ours as opposed to a strongly unified sort of uh, place that you can just press a button at the top and it happens everywhere else. Uh, but uh, um, So I, I see that as one of the very saleable uh, products of Canada and one where... Federalism. I, well, it is a federalism, I guess, I like of it. sorts, yeah. I like it. We're going to export Canadian federalism, I like it. Well, uh, I know that countries do want to yeah, see yeah, that, yeah. 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 I mean, we often talk about it as a liability in yeah, this country. But it's, a, it's an, asset. It's an asset. Not always, but often. Yeah. Um, before we turn this over, and we've already got the speakers lined up, good. <laughs> this is great. Um, is I want to come back to um, the core questions around um, pricing uh, carbon. And maybe this is to end on a more uh, domestic uh, uh, note. Um, Chris, you've You've certainly written frequently about that a, a price on carbon doesn't necessarily destroy jobs, that we can um, put this back into lower taxes and encourage uh, productivity and uh, companies to be more profitable, and encourage a more innovative en environment. Yet, we're still moving in stops and starts on this, of course, both at the international and at the domestic. Uh, how, how pivotal is this in your mind? To our ability to move ahead. Oh, I think it's I think it's central. So I think I think the biggest obstacle to to attaching prices on pollution or prices on carbon is um, a, cu a couple of things. But one is a it, it, it's set of beliefs. One is a belief that this will um, destroy the economy, uh, and that is just part of a broader belief that you cannot have you cannot improve the, the health of the environment without damaging your economy. Or, vice versa, you, you know, the strengthening the economy invariably leads to environmental degradation. I think there, this mindset is absolutely pervasive, and I think it is absolutely wrong. Um, you know, I think, and, I, and I think one of the things that's happening in Canada is that there's slowly, slowly we are starting to realize that there are genuine, significant and direct costs to our current prosperity associated with damage to the environment. So one example that we talk about in our first report um, that, that, that we released a couple of weeks ago is an estimate by the Canadian Medical Association um, that the, the health costs alone from air pollutants alone over the next 20 years will cost something like 220 plus billion dollars. Okay, so that's ten billion dollars a year. That's just the health costs from air pollutants. You start adding in the costs of lost income and productivity, you start adding in the costs of remediation, you then add in the costs from other types of pollution. And, and those are costs that we don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't recognize that they are there, but we are paying for the healthcare system, we are paying for the remediation. Um, so I think people are starting to recognize that. So it's getting through that mindset that is, the, that is a big, big problem. And I want to come back to the idea about, about uh, 
the effect on jobs, employment, and the economy. Um, one of the things that economists have learned over the years um, is that, uh, and maybe we've always known it, is that um, you know, it actually matters how you raise revenues. A dollar is not a dollar is not a dollar. Um, any, a lot of people think that it doesn't matter which taxes you use, but all taxes may generate an equivalent amount of revenue, but they actually have other effects that are very bad. And the most growth retarding, employment killing taxes we have ever created in history are corporate and personal income taxes, which is hardly surprising. If you're gonna tax the thing you want, chances are you're going to get less of that thing that you want. Whereas taxes on pollution um, reduce pollution and generate revenue. So for those people who are concerned about the effect on the economy of environmental policy, what eco-fiscal reform offers is, well, you gotta look at both sides of this policy package. One side is you price pollution, but the other side is you use those revenues to reduce the most damaging taxes we've got. We should, I mean, it is bizarre to me that our fiscal structures in this country have evolved to the point where we are raising so much revenue based on the things we actually want more of and almost no revenue based on the things that we kind of all agree we want less of. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. Here, here. <laughs> it, it is just bizarre, right? And I mean, nobody would have started the society, but we've evolved to that point. We've evolved by hook and crook over 150 years to that point. But um, so that combined with this mindset that you can't do better in both, um, we just got to get beyond that mindset. And I think we're getting there, slowly. But that's really what the Ecofiscal Commission is about, and that's, that's I'm convinced, the number one obstacle to the Ecofiscal Commission. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, questions from the floor now, and I see three individuals lined up, and I very much encourage uh, Trudeau scholars to come forward. This is in part an event for you, and uh, you have many interesting ideas on this front, I know. So. Uh, I'll, I'll open it up, and depending on how we go, we may have to amalgamate the questions and wait for a response, so please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Kelly, and I have a question for Chris, and I'm, I want to preface it by saying I'm, I'm heartened by the work of the Ecofiscal Commission. I think this is long overdue, and I wish you much, much success, and I'm heartened by the sort of attitudes that you've just displayed about uh, carbon pricing and about taxing the bads rather than the goods. I have a particular Thanks, question. All of our work is still ahead of us. Yes. So. <laughs> well, let me, put, let me try to I put one on the, the same thing in five years. priority list of your work. Um, I'm fully in favor of carbon taxes, necessary but not sufficient. I would say I come down on that side of the discussion. I do want to raise, though, the issue of the subsidies that are already in place in particular for the fossil fuel industry. And I'll refer to my friend David. Where did uh, David, David I warned David I was going to ask him for the numbers on what are the current subsidies to the fossil fuel industry in Canada? About $2 billion. About $2 billion a year that you and I as taxpayers pay to companies whose business model is to cook the earth. And I find that not only bad economics, but highly offensive. Actually, so their business model is to sell you something that can then be used to cook the earth. We, we could discuss that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the issue is, on, on the agenda of the Ecofiscal Commission, yep. um, are you going to be looking early and well at the current largely hidden subsidies to the fossil fuel industry? Because it's just another example of subsidizing the bads rather than the goods. And frankly, the, the subsidies for energy efficiency and renewable energy in Canada, which get a lot of headlines, pale by comparison in the hidden subsidies that have been in the system for 20 or 30 years for the fossil fuel industry. If, if indeed we have five times as much fossil fuel in the ground as we can afford to burn, then why are we subsidizing exploration and development? Reach into the converted. So I've got a three-part answer. The first part is a story. Um, so I was the Clifford Clark visiting economist at the Department of Finance in 2009, 2010. And in the uh, fall of 2009, the G20 leaders met in Pittsburgh 
and they committed to reducing fossil fuel subsidies, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and by Christmas of that year, we realized in the Department of Finance that um, there had been this commitment and that we had to do something about it. And so they saw me and they appointed me as Canada's fossil fuel subsidy expert. And I thought, well, that's kind of shocking. I, apparently you don't need to know much about fossil fuel subsidies to be called Canada's expert on this issue. So I then participated in a bunch of meetings with G20 people. Um, and it was a fascinating set of meetings. Um, and number one, there is a fair amount of debate uh, about IISD numbers and other numbers on, on what the subsidies really are. Okay. Number two, the federal government has actually made some headway on this in the last three budgets. I think there's still some remaining, but there has been some headway. Um, the third part is, the, is about the Ecofiscal Commission. Um, one of the things on our agenda is to address um, environmentally harmful subsidies, but we will also address subsidies that may be environmentally benign but fiscally ineffective. So this is something that may end up, frankly, pissing off some people in this room. Um, because there are some subsidies that, while they may be environmentally benign or maybe even slightly environmentally beneficial, they may also be, at the same time, incredibly fiscally ineffective or expensive. And so um, we plan on uh, taking on these topics, for sure. Um, one of the things I, should, I will say, just in, in closing, is that some of these topics appear to be very easy until you actually get into them, and then you realize that they are just wickedly complicated. Um, but, you know, we've, that's why we've got good people on the commission. No, we're, we're just groupies for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I have uh, the next question, please? I'm David Schindler, I'm a Trudeau mentor, and I'd like to, to get the panelists to comment on some of the temporal aspects. And The reason that I started thinking about this was when this much trumpeted Canada-China uh, agreement on reducing emissions by 2030 was announced, I thought, I'd like to see what the real numbers mean. And I found the U.S has already peaked in CO2 emissions at about 6 million tons a year in 2008, uh, precipitated not by green groups, but by mendacious uh, Wall Street investors. But I can't even come up with a number for Canada. The rate of increase is going straight up. Next year, they will be a 50% greater emitter than the U.S. and. Uh, the rate is going up so fast that it's impossible to even predict where they might be by 2030. Uh, a, a rough calculation indicates that they will single-handedly exceed all of the emissions that uh, we think we can put into the atmosphere and stay below two degrees by 2020. No other country matters. And if you do the plots, you can only plot three countries on a, a plot. China, the U.S., and uh, India appears at a little ripple at the bottom. Nobody else even matters. How do we turn this around? Obviously, a lot of their great green innovations are built on the backs of emitting CO2. Yeah, I, uh, it's a really, uh, David, it's really a good uh, question. And the, the thing that troubles me, and the China side specifically, is that they're agreeing to growth uh, through that agreement. And I've seen some curves that suggest if you take a kind of an ellipse that you know, gets to 2030, that could mean about a third more emissions coming out of China than they're currently being emitted. So that's, that's and I think one, that's one of the reasons why I think China is going to have to accelerate getting off the coal uh, thing first and then uh, on the oil next, uh, which means that for British Columbia and its natural gas, there may be a big market out there. But, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of smoke and mirrors in there. What I think, uh, in addition, though, is the momentum that's building uh, for the green growth, uh, you know, talking about the stuff that Chris is talking about. Well, there's a, right now, they're going to bring forward a bill for a green tax reform in China. Uh, you know, so the things like this, it's happening. What I see is uh, two things. One is, is specific to China again, and you're absolutely right, three countries are India, and it's 
worrisome in some ways, but it's well below the others. Uh, but is China going to just uh, uh, put it onto our balance sheets if we get a gateway pipeline or something like that, or uh, if it goes down through Louisiana and then to China, uh, then we get, we get it on our spreadsheet, they don't get it on their spreadsheet. It doesn't help the world at all. So, so we've got to, this, some things have to be really examined closely, and we shouldn't be applauding that much about that agreement. But the big value of that agreement, it's broken a logjam. So others now are going to come in and, and, and going to be embarrassed by uh, if they're not there. And that's one of the things that, uh, that uh, Canada needs to consider very strongly is uh, uh, can it afford to be embarrassed by. The, the, the dialogue I have with diplomats, because I deal with the people from a lot of different countries, and at times it's pretty embarrassing because I'm just told point blank, what has happened to your country in this dialogue? You know, we're, we're just not used to, we don't want to deal with your uh, diplomats anymore. Uh, and and that's kind of hurts a lot, actually. So anyways, uh, I'll stop there. So, you know, I have to be an international component to your uh, Aruba. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Chris. You can't duck. A, you can't duck that much. <laughs> so I was just going to underline the point that Art made about the about breaking the logjam. So it's very easy to look at this. I mean, the graph that I've seen that you're referring to, um, and I couldn't avoid the the smart ass thought that if you really want to see all the other countries on the same chart, you just use a log scale and everything. Will be good. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> but but you're quite right. I mean, China is literally going off the charts, and. Um, and so you can look at that agreement and say, well, what's the point of this agreement? Because, you know, the emissions are just, are just off the charts and they're going to do that for another 15 years. And while they cap at 2030, there's not a statement about where they cap, right? So they could actually go infinitely yeah, yeah, or that's, almost that's right. and, then, and then start to come down. So you say, well, that doesn't look very good. But from an international diplomatic point of view, I mean, it's, it is quite remarkable to have China commit to anything. Now, it's another thing to say, are they actually going to do their commitments? And will the U.S. actually fulfill their commitments? But up until now, we have not had a China or, frankly, any other major developing country that is really prepared to make a, a significant commitment. So, I mean, this is a long and torturous process with 197 countries around the table. And, you know, the process, any process with 197 countries around the table um, is going to be pretty difficult. So I think the real, um, the real news is that, that they were prepared to make a commitment, and then we just have to make, make sure that it keeps getting better and more stringent over time. And, let, and, and let's not know. forget that, that any agreement with the developing world had to have the framework of when will your emissions peak. It's impossible for the developing world to wave a magic wand and have their emissions peak today and go down. So. The devil's in the details, what's the rate of incline, what's the peak, what's the rate of, I mean, that's where it really matters. But the framework and saying, we acknowledge that your issue is when you peak, right? Two boats in the water, one's going 10 miles an hour, one's going two miles an hour. It takes just as much work to slow the big boat down by two miles an hour as it takes the, to slow the other boat to, to, to a given that the stop, graph right? looks the way it does, would you rather have that graph with a commitment to do something in 2030 or that graph with no commitment at all? Because the graph wasn't going to change. But it's terrifying. End of the day, you start by it is terrifying. Two degrees is in the rearview mirror. There is no way we are stopping at two degrees. It is all hands on deck. Three and a half might be tough. And so no, it's terrifying. But it doesn't mean you know, nine to one in the third, you stay on the ice. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, two questions in a row here. I guess, I guess you do, but yeah. Four to one. Four and, to one in the and, third and to stay on the ice. Your goalie just isn't useful. <laughs> okay, you bookie, stop it. <laughs> two questions in a row, please. So my, my name is Chris Kennedy. I'm a professor at the U of T in, in engineering, and I, uh, I'm going to give you a question about the development of elect, uh, electronic vehicles and the surrounding smart grid infrastructure and everything that goes with it. And it was really inspired mainly from a comment that Arsa made, but I think both Chris and Tom have added reflections to this. So, uh, Art, you mentioned that Can uh, Chinese cities can learn from Canadian cities, and ironically, uh, we snuck out of, I'm a fellow with the Global Cities Institute, which is actually upstairs in this hotel on the 11th floor, and we snuck out yesterday afternoon because we've developed, uh, under the leadership of Patricia McCartney, we have ISO standards for city, for city data, and we have all the energy and material flows for the world's megacities, and cities come to us 
to learn about how to do low carbon. And yesterday afternoon we had Shanghai, so we had 20 members of the Shanghai government upstairs, they probably should have been down here actually. Uh, and one of the things we explained to them when we compare uh, cities around the world is that Shanghai is very different to Toronto because Shanghai, in, being in China, has a very high carbon grid and they lie above this magic number. The magic number is about 600 tons of carbon per gigawatt hour. Uh, China, it's about 800, it may be coming down. Whereas, you know, most, most Canadian cities outside of Alberta and Saskatchewan are way, way down. We're really, really close, uh, clean electricity. So, it, it, we don't advise the people of Shanghai to develop electric vehicles because they actually increase their national emissions even higher by about 25% or so, by actually developing electric vehicles. But here we have this situation where China is now actively pushing to develop the electric vehicle market, a little bit like Norway, uh, and making their emissions, at least in the short term, worse. Whereas here we are in Canada, where we've got the technology that Tom's talking about, and we've got the very low carbon grids outside of the two provinces I mentioned, and yet we're really not moving very fast on it. And so, would, so then this goes back to something that Chris raised. I mean, would, would just putting a price on carbon move us fast enough in that direction? Or should we be asking the Chinese to come and invest and in, instead of building EV infrastructure in China, build, can, can Chinese build EV infrastructure in Canada to get us going in the direction we need to go? So. That's my question. Great question. We'll, we'll wait. Uh, I think Art is uh, chomping at the bit to no, answer. Well, I'll answer, but uh, let's. But uh, we'll we'll go on to another question first, David. Hi, um, I'm David Runnels. I'm neither a Trudeau nor a scholar, but I have three observations. Uh, one, one relates to China, and and I think one of the things that Art said we ought to take fairly seriously. The Chinese are actually inherently very conservative particularly when the leadership commits itself to something like this. We actually know what the number is, David. I mean, they've, they've, been, pretty, they've been pretty open about what the number is for 2030. I'd be willing to bet quite a lot of money that it'll be a lot lower than that. That they'll discover once they get going, it's, as it always happens, it's easier to do this stuff than they started at the beginning. So I, I actually think this, this agreement with Obama is significant in two ways. One is I think they'll probably beat that number. And the second is, it basically takes away the cover for countries like India and Indonesia uh, to say, oh, well, we're a developing country, we're not going to accept any targets. The Chinese have now done it, and it's going to be quite difficult for the other developing country members of the G20 not to do it. Uh, the second relates to Brian Kelly's remarks about subsidies. We did a lot of work on that when I was at ISD. The interesting development in this is that the IMF, the sort of mother church of economic orthodoxy, has entered the battle. And by taking what's called the social cost of carbon, which is, I think, what, Chris, $35 a ton? Basically, an agreed number that's produced by some secret committee in the United States of economists. Um, it's the damage cost caused by climate change. By taking that, you get an annual subsidy bill to the fossil fuel industry globally of $1.9 trillion a year. So it's serious money. That's basically the cost of direct subsidies plus the actual damage cost created by CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's a serious amount of money. It's not being taken relatively seriously. It's one of the table turners, I think, uh, in the international discussions. And the final observation is about SDTC. I've been a member of the Council of SDTC since it was started, and it seems to me it's a very interesting example that for Canada and other fields as well, it's, it's not as Ed Koch, or as the, the guy sent in to bail out New York City said, somebody said, what do you think the problem is with New York City went bankrupt? The guy said their problem is they're spending other people's money as if it were other people's money. Uh, SDTC is spending our money, it's, it's a billion and a half dollars. But it's pretty parsimonious. A lot of the people in the clean tech community, community don't like it because its peer review process is very rigorous. It's very difficult to get money from them. They never put up more than a third of the money. But what's happened is because they're so good at this, there are a number of venture capital funds in California that will actually fund organizations that have been approved by SDTC because their, their process, their due diligence is so rigorous that it saves them having to spend the money on it. So it's a very interesting example of a way in which you can take public money and genuinely use it to, to, to foster innovation. And the third link, which is the one we built with Export Development Canada, 
as these guys have said, is critical because almost none of these technologies, once they get to market, are, the Canadian market isn't big enough. So you have to find another market somewhere. And EDC, for all sorts of reasons, uh, thinks that that's a part of the Canadian economy. It wants to get going. It makes EDC look better. It takes away the focus from the fact that much of their their, their money is going to the mining sector, which is extremely controversial. So it's a very interesting marriage, and it, I think it's a, it's a model for other sorts of similar sorts of activities in Canada. And I, I sort of commend it to you as something to look at in a bit more detail. Thank you. David, I have a lot of topics to address there. Art, do you want to sure, tackle quickly, the first question? Uh, uh, if, first of all, I think uh, as, as these questions are coming out and from what we've said, we've got to recognize that we're talking about a green transformative change that in policies and so forth, it's, it's complicated. And uh, uh, we've got to recognize that and, and go for the things at least that we can uh, move on impressively and quickly as, as one important, important part of it. Uh, th this business about the high carbon uh, uh, grid, which is really interesting, and the, the thing is Shanghai, yes, uh, Shanghai's got big problems too and it knows it, and, and uh, other cities as well are trying to reduce that very quickly, which is why I think we're going to see, I mean, coal is the obvious thing because it's got such a high carbon, and so we're going to see coal first, and then it'll be after that that uh, we'll see the uh, caps on the, uh, the oil, and then the uh, other stuff moving more quickly. Uh, I, I think the important thing about this this whole question of infrastructure, infrastructure is the Chinese have a vision of things that they want to be a world leader in the EVs. And they're going to be prepared to support that in a lot of different ways. And so, yes, in the short run, maybe Shanghai uh, shouldn't have that. And obviously, all the city, cities have to really develop their public uh, transportation infrastructure. And the Beige, I use the Beijing subway all the way all the time. And it's gone from about 150 kilometers in the time I've been working there uh, to now 500 kilometers roughly. And it's, it makes every other subway in the world that I've been on just seem like something from the past. And the high speed rail between cities, et cetera. So uh, they, what they're doing is they're trying to set in place a vision for infrastructure, uh, limits uh, as they've learned now. We told them in 1996, don't go the private car route. They were seeing at that point in time that was going to be the next major element of the economy. So they ignored the advice. Now they're going back and saying, we've got to do this. We've got to make the change. Um, uh, so that private cars, uh, you, maybe you'll have them. And the joke among my friends is that, uh, yes, and park them in a garage somewhere too. Uh, you know, because it's an object of rich and culture, uh, rich uh, sorts of things, identity. But anyway, the, the other thing I, I just wanted to throw in here, because it relates to all of this, that the Chinese leaders recognize the scale of the problem. Like 12, uh, I've seen some recent figures that compared the cost of air pollution, 12% of the GDP. And, and also the Chinese, since Wen Jiabao particularly uh, was premier over the last uh, uh, eight, 10 years, uh, they, they uh, believe that uh, they are victims of climate change. And, and they see, they, I can cite endless amounts of evidence that they bring forward that say we're being affected by climate change. So the motivation is very strong to accelerate, as David was saying, uh, probably do better, just as they've done economically. Now they want to do better environmentally. They want to exceed their targets. So we'll see what happens. Other comments from the Okay, two more questions, please. Great. My name is Nathan Lemfers. I'm a 2014 Trudeau Scholar. And I um, just wanted to thank the panelists uh, for this really engaging conversation. I think it's essential that we're having it here. Although one thing that I'm surprised we haven't been talking about with regards to China-Canada relations and technological innovations is the oil sands as well. Um, and that's uh, something that China has indeed shown a lot of interest in the technological innovation that has been going on there. Most notably, the at the time, the largest foreign takeover that China has ever done of Nexen Oil for $15 billion of many, many billions of dollars of investments and interests in, uh, in oil sands pipelines as well. Um, and outside of China, uh, China has also shown interest uh, in other uh, heavy oil plays around the world, whether it's Venezuela and special relationships that they've developed there, whether it's the DRC or Madagascar in Africa as well. And there's certainly um, arguments to be made that they're also using uh, the relationship that they're building here to, to apply the 
technological innovations to those other resource plays. And I'm curious how, given the, the, the recent uh, uh, change with this uh, bilateral Canada or China-US agreement, um, and, and the difficulties that have been plaguing a lot of these uh, West Coast export options for the oil sands has impacted um, uh, China's relationship with Canada and, and uh, on those sorts of matters. Thank you. Uh, do you want to take another question? Or do, do you want to oh, sorry. Uh, sure. Yes, thanks. <laughs> sorry. Can, I, can I respond to, um, to a question that he didn't ask? <laughs> but Art reminded me that I had to... Uh... It's just the mention of the oil sands. Um, uh, sorry, is that, is that okay? It's fine. Yeah. Yes. Do it, do it. That's um, fine. So that's the second question now, you see, that you've got... Go ahead. <laughs> I actually think there is a... Um, I think there's a tendency in this country, uh, certainly in parts of this country, but I think in many parts of this country, to obsess about the oil sands. I think the oil sands... It is an issue, but if the oil, just imagine a world where the oil sands did not exist. Just wave that magic wand and two million barrels a day of oil sands just disappears and Fort McMurray all of a sudden looks like it did 50 years ago, okay? Just imagine that world. Would the world still have a problem with climate change? Yes. Would the world still be addicted to fossil fuels? Yes. Would Canadian consumers still like to drive their cars and heat their homes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Would we still have an eco-fiscal commission? Yes. What would it say? Exactly the same thing that it is saying today. This, all of this is not about the oil sands. The oil sands is one very small piece, very small piece in the global problem. But it's okay. a significant... It is a larger piece in the Canadian problem. I agree with that. It's a larger piece in the Canadian problem. But even in a world with no oil sands, we should be having this discussion, all of the discussion about the need for technological change, the discussion about the need for pricing. We really shouldn't let that tail wag the much bigger and more important dog. It's just, we shouldn't. So that's just, I, I'll just throw that grenade out there. Just <laughs> see what happens. I'll let it land. I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> well, you'll get a chance in a minute, Tom. Uh, another question. Uh, hi, uh, Lloyd Helferty from uh, Canadian Biochar Initiative. Um, I've been having conversations uh, with the leadership of a group called JUICE, uh, the Joint U.S.-China Collaboration on Clean Energy uh, in Shanghai, uh, regarding uh, the uh, deployment of technologies for biochar and programs for biochar in China, especially with respect to uh, forestry and, and other, other applications. Um, but I'd like to know how the panel thinks uh, regarding the um, Prime Minister Harper and what he's doing with respect to China and the relationship between Canada and China um, and what comments you might have regarding uh, the new FIPA, the Foreign Investment and Promotion Agreement that was recently signed. Okay, panelists. Okay, um, well, uh, first of all, I think we should highlight the, uh, these kinds of agreements, the uh, investment agreement, trade agreements, and I think in the absence of uh, WTO being able to pull itself together and get agreements, what we're seeing is uh, a huge increase in bilateral or regional agreements, uh, and China's been one of the leaders in that, and they have their motives for it. Uh, but what I find conspicuously absent is more than lip service to uh, dealing with the environmental issues. It's very upsetting because the WTO has moved somewhat in that direction, quite quite well in some ways. But more is needed. But but we're going to have this is a reality check that we have to deal with. And I, as far as I can see, it's going to last for a long, long time now. And and uh, I do find it. You know, it's not like. Uh, not like our good old NAFTA agreement, which had a strong and carefully worked out uh, uh, stuff on environment in it. These ones don't, uh, for the most part. Uh, so that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, I, I think that uh, the um, uh, question of the oil sands is an interesting one. Uh, one time, uh, several years ago, before the oil sands were nearly as big as they are now, and, and uh, I was kind of sidewinded by uh, uh, a question in Vancouver. Somebody, a uh, very senior Canadian uh, politician had, uh, in fact, uh, had, a group, had a very strong, at that time was the head of the Chinese Business Council, Canada Chinese Business Council. 
And, and uh, he had a group from China of uh, leading politicians from there. And so the question, I didn't know that they were going to the uh, oil sands the next day. And so the question he asked me to address was, well, uh, you know, what, would, what should I tell them about the oil sands from an environmental point of view? And so I thought about it for a minute, and I said, well, you know, it's, um, it's, it's like the Three Gorges Dam. Whatever you think of it, we're really not going to have it fully worked out uh, beforehand in the development, what are all the problems, because there's going to be a lot of surprises. And David Schindler is better equipped than anybody to tell us about those things. Um, and and uh, the second point, though, is that they be it's going to become a world icon in the same way that uh, Exxon Valdez or the Three Gorges Dam, no matter how important it is, uh, as Chris was saying, well, maybe it's not the most important thing in the world, it's become the iconic symbol, and it's hit U EU and so forth. Uh, and, and then, though, getting back to the reality check on why China is doing these agreements, China, think of China, ultimately its population is going to be about 1.5 billion people, okay? It has gone through times when 50 or 60 million people died of starvation. Uh, we can say good things about the environmental, about how much food they should import and how much they should uh, not manufacture themselves, because the last 10% of becoming food self-sufficient in China means a huge application of fertilizer, which is killing the environment, killing groundwater, et cetera. Uh, and, and so uh, the Chinese government, basically, the leaders don't want people to starve. They see they want people to have a good life as well, and that life involves energy. So what they're looking for in things like, they've got a longer term vision than, than we have about things like the uh, uh, oil sands, I think. What they want is secure and reasonably uh, safe, so safe in the sense that they can access them when they need them. Uh, sources of energy. Where they get it from, whether it's Venezuela, Canada, uh, uh, or somewhere in Africa, some nasty state in Africa, in fact, where they've got some things from, um, Canada ranks rather high in that list. That's why they'll stay at the table. They don't need that oil. They, they can get other sources. Same with natural gas. Uh, so what they're looking for is uh, security of supply. That's number one. They're willing to pay almost any price for security of supply. The thing that's new in the equation now is they're talking about ecological security. Uh, and, and that's a much more complex problem because what they see is that uh, they're doing things to their own environment that is making it poisonous for people and it's destroying ecosystems. And they're as aware as anybody in this world about ecological goods and services. And in fact, their eco-compensation programs are now larger than any in the world. So their, their ultimate objective is to have about 25% of the country covered in forests, and they're now at 21%. And hillsides that during Maoist times were just totally stripped uh, are now, I, I worked with uh, one of the leading forestry people in the country, and it's just amazing what's been accomplished. So they've got some long-term goals, and, and sometimes it's inexplicable to us why they would stay with something when it's clearly not making money for them, as the oil science is the case right now. But they've got a different set of objectives. Just quickly, I, I, I agree with Chris about most things, so it's nice to find something that we disagree about. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> um, uh, no single energy project anywhere in the world makes a difference on climate change, just like no single vote makes a difference in an election. We don't tell people not to vote. Um, but sometimes projects matter because they, they, can, they can ignite a kind of a political acceptance. They can, they can change the way negotiations occur and so on. If Canada, a wealthy country with a history of high moral purpose in international affairs, right? This is our image of ourselves, peacekeepers and so on. We were right there with Britain in World War II and so on and so forth. If Canada, a wealthy country, can't voluntarily limit rates of extractions of fossil fuels, the most carbon-heavy fossil fuels on the planet, how on earth do we expect to have a voice at the table in the most important negotiations of this century, which is how are we going to limit carbon between now and 2050? So, no, again, I agree it doesn't make a drop in the bucket in terms of climate change, but it is more than a drop in a bucket when it comes to Canada batting above its weight in trying to affect the trajectory of global carbon emissions. I'm that sorry case, to say, I'm sorry to say. Don't say you agree with me. I agree with you. I, I, everything he said. So, Jennifer, so we don't disagree. There darn it. Jennifer had signaled, those of you who are desperate for coffee, that we could go on a little longer. So we've got plenty of time for the 
questions for these two patient individuals who've been standing at the mic. So please go ahead. Hello, my name is Dominique, and I, I first want to thank this young gentleman behind me because he let me go in front of him saying, did you see the, the gender imbalance in this uh, conversation so far? <laughs> So what I wanted to ask, I, I, I've, I've been struck by one thing um, in this conversation, um, is um, you've been talking about transformative change and all that, but no one's really questioned um, the, the system that is um, creating the problem to begin with, you know, growth and uh, the, 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 the carbon emissions are mostly due to our consumption and growth. And um, in, in speaking, you know, about China and, uh, you know, their continued growth and, and what you're looking at is simply a substitution uh, of energy, but nothing about reducing our energy consumption. I mean, fundamentally, they grow because we buy their crap and we need to do something about that. Um, I'm, I'm currently doing a, a joint PhD with um, a French university and Canadian university. I'm comparing energy consumption and buildings between the two, two continents. And, and I think it's a good comparison because we look to Europe as having a good quality life and, you know, uh, great food and, and, you know, and, but they're not dependent on growth. I mean, their economy is not growing. I mean, a lot of people say that's a problem. But, you know, I live there and, and it's, you know, it's not a bad life. And fundamentally, Europeans, as we all know, use half the resources per capita that we do. And they have a good life. So do we not have to first reduce our consumption, reduce our energy before we talk about, you know, all these new great technologies? That's my question. That's an economist question. Could, could, just to the, to the uh, you identify yourself. How do I identify myself? Dominic. No, Dominic. what's your name? Dominique. 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 Thank you, Dominique. Dominique. That's an economist question, is it not? Yeah, it's broader than <laughs> that. Yes. Um, are we going to have a second question? Yes, I think, sure, we'll go along. Sure, we'll get you two. Um, well, my, uh, he actually kind of rang on just about everything that I had. Um, basically, uh, I, I had a, a, a slightly different angle, but very similar point. Um, I just look at technological innovation as addressing a symptom of climate change. And um, when we look at the root cause of climate change, the root cause is human behavior. Uh, so climate change is a human behavior problem, and there is actually psychological innovation and technological innovation, how you change human behavior. So could you please comment on what policies and funding exists to assist organizations that actually address the root cause of climate change? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to I think you. those two are qu quite connected. Okay, so um, let me just talk about growth for a bit. Um, it is clearly true that um, uh, economic growth, economic activity is overwhelmingly based on energy. Energy is overwhelmingly represented by fossil fuels and therefore you can draw a pretty tight line from economic activity to greenhouse gas emissions. All right, that's just, that strikes me as um, self-evident. Um, so you can say that growth is the problem. But, and there's a lot of people who say that what we need to do is change the system. And what we need to do is have less growth. But think about this not in an abstract term. Think about what growth means. So what is GDP? That's what we mean by growth. We mean GDP growth. Well, what is GDP? GDP is identically the sum of everybody's income. So how many people in this room would like to have 40% less income this year? How about 80% less income? Because that's what we're talking about. 80% of lower emissions over the next, you know, several decades. So, it, it, and it's pretty reasonable to assume that most people like income. Sorry? That's not the right question. Well, let me just continue for a moment. So, um, income is something that we all like. And income comes from production. That's what it is. So income is something that we all like, and I believe that you all like. I don't think that income is the only thing you like. Okay? But I do think that income is something you like. And in a rich country like ours, it is easier to imagine a world where we all have a little bit less income. But there are two billion people in the world who could only dream of our level of prosperity. So when we start talking about let's having less growth, 
I think it's important that we say, well, what does that mean to have less growth? Well, we could all actually have less, and I, I think that would be okay, but recognize what that means of having less. And a lot of us don't want to have less. Uh, and for a lot of people that have a fraction of what we have, to deny them the opportunity to have anything closer to, much closer to what we have, I think gets problem. I think the real challenge actually is to continue our prosperity, and by prosperity I don't just mean income, I mean many other things as well, but to do it in a much cleaner, more sensible way. I think changing the system is, for, I'm not really sure usually what that means when people say we should abandon the system, but let me just, in case you weren't sure, let me just say that I actually think markets are quite wonderful. I think markets generate a tremendous amount of prosperity. They have done so for billions of people over millions of years, and I think they will continue to do so. The challenge is to use those markets in a way that can unleash the technological potential to solve some of these problems. And I think it's possible with sensible policy. So that's my rant. I'm going to give uh, the other panelists a chance to get in on this, Tom. Um, so I have a slightly different position, although I, I, I take what Chris says at, at face value. Um, I don't think we know how to run an economy without growth. I mean, Galbraith pointed this out in the 60s. We, we don't even know how zero growth economies work, and that's a problem. So I, I, do th and I do think it's impossible to grow in real terms an economy forever in a finite world. And I think that's a deep philosophical question that we are beginning to bump up against with carbon limits. In my view, though, I think in, if we're going to get done what we need to get done in the next 20 to 30 years, which is rebuild our energy systems, uh, I think that argument comes first and we'll deal with the, the, the deeper issue of unlimited growth later. I may, and I could be wrong about this, but let's push it out. Because if we ask for two things at once uh, of democracies and governments around the world, I not only want to say I want to rebuild the entire energy system in 30 years, I also want you to reconsider your entire economic system. I don't think you get both those things. So if there is such a thing as an economic revolution where we go towards zero growth economies, let's push that out 30 years. We, we can't get that on the table at the same time as solving the immediate problem of rebuilding our energy system. So I fall on the side of trying to hit low carbon growth in the next 20 or 30 years and we'll deal with the finite world, infinite growth problem next generation. But I think it's a real problem. I, I, I actually think it's a deep problem. Well, I'm going to give uh, Art a chance to make a comment and then I'm going to disappoint all the, uh, the questioners who've stood up just because we've run 15 minutes now into our break. And uh, you can come up and uh, discuss this with uh, the panelists after. So Art, I'm, you're, you get the last word on the okay. panel. Okay, so, so on growth, uh, uh, I've experienced China and it's 12% growth, 13% growth. You, I, and I've come to the conclusion that, that it is impossible to have sustainable growth at that level, sustainable in the sense of environmentally sustainable. Uh, 3%, I don't know. I, I, it depends, then we're into the quality issues as Tom has said. Uh, the interesting point for me is in that the transformation that's taking place in China, uh, there's a couple of things. One is China's ecological footprint, uh, which is growing, and particularly in cities, influenced by Western advertising, influenced by Western architects. Uh, my colleagues at Tsinghua University wire buildings, uh, you know, wirelessly now, they, they send data on energy use, etc., and that the, the, the iconic and I'll call it the phallic symbols because most of them are designed by males, I guess, who are, want to be higher and higher and higher or something. And, and these are energy hogs, is the way my Chinese colleagues point out. And they've got the data to show it. Uh, it's the wrong kind of buildings. Um, the steel mills, which produce all that, those goods, the, they could get easy money. They're state-owned enterprises. They get easy money from the government. They overinvest. And now government has to shut them down, and particularly the less efficient ones. So they increase the energy efficiency dramatically. But you know what they're doing? Uh, because uh, as it often happens in China, it's shut down, it's off the uh, books, and then they'll just open up quietly because the local governments will encourage it, because they make money for the local governments. So they're now going in, after they deem the building to be, uh, this mill no longer to be used, they go in with bulldozers and make sure that it's permanently uh, put to sleep. Um, and, and so, but the, the important point is that the economy, the Chinese are the world's greatest savers. 
And, and the economy uh, is being shifted into a domestic economy. And now what's that sustainable domestic economy going to look like? Is it going to be everybody driving big cars that are energy hogs, uh, wanting bigger and more apartments and so forth? Or is it going to be truly in a kind of a sustainable um, uh, system of uh, where the Chinese actually have some uh, uh, opportunities? And remember that, uh, that the Chinese per capita consumption of almost everything is much, much lower than ours, even in the, uh, the cities, although we're seeing about 10% of the people in the cities are on a European scale of consumption. Uh, but that's going to change, and uh, there's opportunities to make it change in such a way that it, it's actually uh, reasonable, but I'm afraid it may go the, the wrong way. And so, ultimately, the Chinese Party, the Communist Party, the CPC, has adopted a concept, and you may laugh, but take it seriously, uh, a concept of uh, wanting to construct an ecological civilization in China. That's what they officially want, and that is officially driving public policy now in China. And the point of that, uh, first and foremost, is to develop a better relationship with nature so that we're not destroying nature and, and the home we live in. And, and secondly, it's to go and start introducing ideas, and I, could, I don't have time to go into any of them right now, but uh, introducing ideas of accountability for officials, for industry, and for citizens themselves as to how they can implement uh, ideas that will help to achieve an ecological civilization. Sounds like it's just a big PR job, but it isn't. It's more than that. And uh, if anyone wants to know, I'll be happy to talk uh, about that. So, Thank so. you.